Um, <laughs> you watching that the match is. there, Gav? Uh, yes, I am watching the match. Uh, I am watching the UEFA Europa League Conference League final live, live in Virginia Gavin is, too. Gavin's joined the group chat, but he's actually got an eye on something else. Well, this is mostly for Richard's benefit. This is all multitasking. He's a Roma supporter. <laughs> this and is I'd impressive. Like to see them in a European final. Richard has won several fantasy football leagues since he spoke last week. Yeah, I'm giving up on Journal. journalism and group chatting. <laughs> To go full time on the touchline. It's amazing that Robbie Keane is still on the FAI payroll and they haven't found a job for you yet. Yeah. <laughs> it's only a matter of time. Hello, you're very welcome to the group chat. I am news correspondent of Virgin Media News, Richard Chambers. I am joined by my fellow news correspondent, Zara King. Hello. And political correspondent, Gavin Riley. Hello there. Uh, we will start today with the news which is making headlines uh, across the water from us and that is the Sue Gray report into dun, the dun, parties dun. at Downing Street. Details of drunkenness, of fighting, of late night parties at the heart of government in Downing Street laid bare in a damning report by senior civil servant Sue Gray. It's basically one of those Danny Dyer, like, you know, uh, blokes out on tour series. Except Britain's it's, deadliest party. Yeah, except, except for it's except the British it's in, government. Except it's in Downing Street. Let, let's have a quick run down this. So this long-awaited report, which is basically deciding the future of whether or not Boris Johnson will continue as the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Um, it effectively details karaoke, wine spillages, AIDS getting sick. Vomit on the carpet is pretty much the grimmest. Others being rude to security staff and cleaners. Um, aides and people who worked in Downing Street saying that they believe that they had a, the approval of Boris Johnson to have these parties, in part because he walked through a lot of them, <laughs> in part because he attended some of them. And yet didn't know they were happening in his premises. In part because Somehow. he's photographed with beer cans and toasting people with others. What, what was your, 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 your reaction to this, Zara? Do you think he survives as a result of all of this? Well, he certainly seems to think that he will survive it, which is kind of astonishing. I mean, his response today is sort of, yeah, you know, I take responsibility, but he was asked by Beth Rigby from Sky News and he said, look, no matter how bitter and painful the findings are, we've got to move forward. And by move forward, he means... Let me off. Let me off. Mm -hmm. And I mean, four o'clock wine time in the office, in the middle of a lockdown when, you know, citizens of that country were unable to see one another and say their goodbyes at funerals. All of that seems to have escaped Boris Johnson, his mm. response today. Well, I, I think it's remarkable. Whatever about the, the ostensible explanation that people are allowed to let their hair down because they're all working flat to the map because of the pandemic and there's so much crisis. First of all, the same attitude obviously did not apply to emergency medics or anyone working in the NHS yeah. at the same time. But secondly, the, the ostensible claim that you deserve to wind down with a couple of beers or wine and, and an awful lot of cheese. It was a huge amount of cheese referenced in this report. Um, but that you would be having wine, like wine, Friday wine time, uh, on a Friday afternoon at four o'clock. Wine time Fridays, like, Gav, if WTF. You're, if you're clocking off at four o'clock on a Friday, then you're not working flat to the mat. Yeah. Like, I, I just don't, don't understand that as logic. What I think is remarkable is that it, it seems to have been not only did, did this not strike too many people, there are some exceptions where it clearly did strike them as being a little bit off or that the optics would be terrible, but it doesn't strike them as being all that off or unusual or in any way inappropriate that they would be having so many social gatherings with alcohol. Forget about during a pandemic, but that apparently it is just the culture in number 10 that you'd regularly have Friday wine time or, mm. oh, we're having leaving drinks. So we're going to have a party in the basement and there's going to be somebody breaking a photocopier at like three o'clock in the morning or somebody's going to be... And being quite rude to the security yeah. staff and the cleaning staff. Like and... if you forget about the, the pandemic bit, which of course we shouldn't, but even yeah. if you park the pandemic bit, it's wild. the fact that that's their working culture anyway and that mm. they just seem to be so routinely what did you think of it? getting drunk in the office, it, it just is mad. I think it's, it says a lot to me again about how British politics works, the worst excesses of it, the lack of accountability, uh, the lack of repercussions for people who attended these things. Mm. Boris Johnson has never had any polit political repercussions for anything he's ever done in his life. <laughs> Just keep getting um, promoted, basically. His uh, relationship with the truth is how it's uh, often um, described in the British news media. Mm. The, the relationship with the truth. But it yeah. means you're as, as either if telling it or you're yes, not. Yes, as if it's yeah. something that you can sort of interact with from afar. Like yeah. the, the point you're making, Zara, about how they treated custodians and cleaners yeah. and security. The fact that in Laura Koonsberg's um, panorama piece for the BBC mm. Uh, mm. earlier on in the week, um, she spoke to one um, custodian at Downing Street who basically told him there was a party going on with about 30 people in the room. She was like, please move away. They were mocked and jeered. Yeah. Um, 
that level of entitlement that they think that you can do this, mm. that you can work in Downing Street, have parties that end at four in the morning, turn up for work the next day, th the level of entitlement. The fact as well that one of the most senior civil servants in there, uh, a Mr Reynolds, uh, basically saying we seem to have got away with that. Yeah, he's they the knew that they were doing what so they were doing was his wrong. His job is the private principal secretary, uh, private personal secretary to Boris Johnson, which basically means if it's anything comparable to the Irish counterpart, it basically means that you're responsible for like managing the PM's diary and appointments and anything like that. So the idea that he was so central and was organising all these dues and was suggesting, oh, the weather's going to be good uh, on some random evening next week, so let's have a, a BYOB party in the garden and send the invite to 200 people and that the Prime Minister would be somehow so detached from that that he had no idea it was going on. Mm. I, I find kind of baffling. But then, as you say, and, and this is maybe the most salient bit, you, they can't really argue ignorance and say that they kind of didn't realise that what they were doing was so inappropriate or so far removed from the rest of the country. Because from the, one of those very early ones where they're organising drinks uh, in, in a, a May of, of 2020, and they're talking about, oh, can we get away with that? And they're like, oh, just be careful about the optics. And then the same guy is caught messaging someone afterwards saying, I think we got away with it. But then having to be reminded then the next time, oh, we're going to have a do. Lads, don't go around holding wine bottles because you know there's a COVID press conference on and it would be really bad if you got caught on camera like I just, holding wine bottles. This, there's a press conference going yeah. on to explain the very thing that you're breaching. And, and no one shouted stop. But that's, that's half this problem, is that they weren't actually concerned about breaching, they were concerned about getting caught. Yeah. It wasn't about, yeah. you know, upholding the laws that they were telling the public to uphold and telling people to adhere to. It wasn't about that for them at all. It seems that the report reveals that they were more concerned about their reputation as opposed to upholding the laws that they expected everyone mm. else to adhere to. Pretty much. And I remember, I think a lot of us will remember some of the NHS UK government messaging from earlier on the pandemic, where it was like very hard-hitting images of people on bench ventilators and sort of like big bold letters tell her this woman in the ventilator mm. that you didn't that you didn't bend the rules mm. Mm. Uh, and at the very time that I was running yeah. number 10 yeah. was bending the rules if not breaking them outright yeah well, well gee massive surprise here <laughs> guess who broke all the rules yeah. multiple yeah. times then yeah. said he didn't yeah. realize that it was a thing this has like there's political yeah. repercussions of this obviously and, and, and for, and, and, the and they, might, they may not be over because the, the political ramifications for him, they sort of depend now, you know, people will, will they'll see clips on the news of Keir Starmer or Ian Blackford or some of his own backbenchers. It, the internal bit is the most important now because the opposition are not going to be able to unseat Boris Johnson. It's a question of whether the party decides to rebel against him. And there were some suggestions uh, today, Wednesday, the day of, of recording, that they were getting close to the 56 signatures that they might need to trigger a no-confidence vote within the party. Mm. Uh, and that there were so many people who were so unimpressed by his, you know, chin down and brazen it out attitude that they think that he, they need to be moved against. Um, so we will wait to see whether we do reach that threshold. But I suspect if he makes it to the weekend and they haven't reached that, then you'll have Tory MPs simultaneously, you know, whining that they're going to lose the next election, but also not doing anything to counter that outlook or just that problem. A final point before we finish up. Three in five Britons in a survey today thinking that Boris Johnson should resign. So it'll mm. be interesting to see how it plays And out. three quarters of the public, including half of Conservative voters, think he knowingly lied about Partygate. It does seem like he's going to tough it out, but we'll see how that all goes. Mm. Um, Zara, you've been taking the lead on monkeypox for us. Yes. And there has been a lot of I suppose social media talk about this. A lot of people are like, oh my God, we're bouncing into another public health crisis. Mm. But. Yeah, we want to take a couple of minutes just to, uh, I suppose, monkey pox myth bust because we did put a question box out on Instagram this week just to ask people, I suppose, what were the things they were most concerned about? And we went to the experts. We were speaking with a virologist, Dr. Killian de Gascoigne from the National Virus Reference Laboratory. So uh, Killian and his team are the ones who are monitoring monkey pox. And uh, so far, there's only been less than five samples processed in Ireland. There's no positive cases here. So we're going to take you through a couple of answers from Killian. I'm going to begin with uh, that key question that most people sent in is, should we be really worried about this and here's what Killian had to say. We're in a situation where globally immunity against smallpox is waning. Now the question is whether that's provided an opportunity to monkeypox to re-emerge or whether the event that we're seeing at the moment is just a single spillover event that's just uh, one of those things that happens every now and again where we get an outbreak of a, of a zoonotic infection. So at the moment, even though we've got, I think more than 150 cases have been reported across Europe at this stage, given the population of Europe, that's still a very small number. So no, I don't think people need to be unduly concerned at this point in time. I think a lot of people would have felt that they may never have had to have seen Killian de Gascoigne or anybody who was previously <laughs> associated with Neffet ever again. And the fact that they are now on television again probably will fill them with some alarm. But 
there's also an, an element of mm. this is a very different situation from that which we were facing into at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Oh yeah, look, this is a completely different situation. And I think that's, you know, kind of the key point from uh, the likes of Killian Degaskin, he's sort of out to allay concerns, I would say. Um, look, a, a lot of people kind of as well putting in questions like about their children. It was really interesting to hear that, that children have yeah. some concerns actually when they hear monkeypox. Because I, I guess they, they find it harder to distinguish between what we've seen for the last two years and they, they don't, they can't really register about how abnormal yeah. that is, that you don't see every public health threat as being this kind of existential crisis. So maybe it's kind of understandable they don't have that perspective. Yeah, and it was interesting actually, because like a few people had said that they, their kids were playing this game called Monkey Pox in the playground and everything, that it had filtered down to that level, which is kind of sad to hear that really, and that they had some concerns. So uh, we put that to uh, Kenny Degaski and today, uh, one lady who had said, um, how worried should we be? My seven-year-old son is terrified about another virus and the potential impact it could have. And here's what Killian had to say. No, and I think it's, it's, it's a really interesting question after the last two years. But no, I think from a, a child's perspective, this isn't going to be, you know, this virus is nowhere near as transmissible as, as COVID. It's not going to infect as many people as COVID, he says, famous last words. But generally speaking, we know that this virus is less infectious. One thing actually, Zara, which I think um, people might have noticed about a lot of the, the international reporting of monkeypox so far, is that there has been a lot of... Stigma has been used in this, and this might, mm. you know, have some historic parallels. I know the United Nations was actually out earlier on on Wednesday, sort of saying that some of the reporting on this has been uh, racist, some of it has been homophobic, mm -hmm. and it has undermined the response. So obviously, that's a concern when you have, you know, stigmas attached to public health concerns. Yeah. If the whole idea is to bring people forward mm. while stigmatizing. Them, Those who have kind of the yes. exact yeah. opposite of what you want to do. Yeah, so the latest report from the European Centre for Disease Control is just pointing to the fact that the majority of cases that are confirmed at the moment are in men who have sex with men. But the reality is, of course, that it's not just men who have sex with men who can contract monkeypox. And that's another question we wanted to put to Kylian de Gascoigne, and here's what he had to say about that. Yeah, and absolutely. I think like there was a family cluster in, in the UK that uh, hadn't hadn't linked. So I think the key thing from the virus perspective is that it doesn't it doesn't care about your sexuality and it's not targeting particularly particular individuals. The thing is, if people are either are shedding virus or have lesions and they have sort of prolonged sort of skin to skin contact or direct contact with somebody who's infected or somebody who's susceptible, then obviously the risk of transmission increases. But that really doesn't matter whether, as I said, whether it's homosexual sex or heterosexual sex or whatever sort of direct skin skin contact it is. So, Zara, just w one question on this yeah. is like, how long do they think that this health care is actually going to continue on for? Yeah, so it's interesting. Killian was kind of saying today that he doesn't actually think it will drag on for too long. He thinks that, you know, the incubation period is around 21 days, that the cases we're seeing now are people who would have become infected in the last couple of weeks. He thinks that, uh, I suppose, the awareness campaign now is having a big impact in terms of people knowing what to look out for and then uh, self-isolating. So the people who have monkeypox or have those symptoms are isolating for up to 21 days. If you get it, it's a relatively mild illness in most cases. You know, it's a case of sort of seeing it out. There's mm. not even really uh, much treatment in terms of maybe, you know, if you've got a fever, perhaps some paracetamol or whatever. It's not really a majorly serious illness. There's, you know, two people, I think, at the moment in ICU in the UK, but ultimately, you know, the point that they're making, and I, just to summarise, I suppose, because I think there's just been so much about monkeypox this week, I really wanted to kind of get to, to experts like that and get the answers. Killian is saying, look, don't worry about it. You know, like, nobody should be in a mass panic about this at the moment. We don't have any confirmed cases in Ireland. Yes, they do expect that we will have confirmed cases in Ireland uh, over the next couple of days or weeks or whatever, but that ultimately uh, it's not going to be anything near the scale of what we saw uh, in COVID and there's not going to be any lockdown. <laughs> well, it, it's important, obviously, people being assured that this isn't a lockdown sort of territory or even any kind of a threat yeah. is obviously good to know and, and worth reasserting as well. But it's also kind of good to remind people that actually, maybe with a little bit of benefit of what we've lived through for the last two years, that it's possible almost to sort of nip this in the bud because now people know what sort of behaviours you need to do if you might be infected. That if, yeah. if, you, if you know what to look out for, and you know there probably isn't any asymptomatic transmission like there has been with other viruses in the last couple of years, that actually you can stop the spread before it becomes so endemic that you can't ever put the toothpaste back in the tube again. And that's maybe a source of optimism that we're not hearing much about, but is worth bearing in mind. Yeah. Well, thanks for busting those myths, Zara. It's no something problem. I'm sure we'll have to come back to at some point. <laughs> I will keep an eye how this one turns out. Now, obviously, uh, this week, uh, so much of news coverage around the world has been dominated by the situation in Texas. 19 children, as of Wednesday uh, evening, were killed. Two of their teachers were also killed. They were barricaded in a classroom by uh, a shooter. All of the children who were killed were aged between 7 and 10. Um, I think 
it's noteworthy, I suppose, that we talk a lot about how politicians react to things in Ireland on this podcast. And it's very easy to get despondent and disappointed and disheartened, I suppose, by how politicians react to things here. And there's a level of cynicism about some approaches. But I think that universally here in Ireland and most places in the Western world, people watching mm -hmm. how politicians react to these things in the United States, it's just alien that you automatically have this situation where, you know, we are 10 years on from the mass shooting in Sandy Hook, which was, you know, the worst one before this in recent memory. Mm. Um, all of the kids who died in Sandy Hook, um, none of them would have turned 18 even now. Yeah. Um, and that's 10 years on from then. Perfect. And we have this situation where um, you're automatically hearing people who are, you know, parents of the Parkland shooting and parents of, even Columbine going back to, to, to a, a long way down the tracks, they're calling for answers, they're calling for action so that nobody else has to ever go through this again. And yet, you know, people are. They're the same calls that we were hearing around the time of Sandy Hook. Yeah. Like the conversation remains the same, but the problem is still there. It hasn't changed. Yeah, and it's, um, I've seen a lot of people and it's very hard to disagree with the argument that once Sandy Hook happened, and nothing materially changed afterwards that the laws by and large are still the same as they always were. Mm -hmm. Then it, that was it, it was almost as if American society decided that, well, actually, this is terrible, but if we're not going to do anything about it, then this is a, a level of terror and terribleness with which we are terribly comfortable, uh, which is so depressing. And actually what's been so much more remarkable, and I think this is the only thing that I think is maybe different about it this time, is that because this is the latest in an unfortunately growing trend of school shootings as opposed to just the general mass shootings that we often get in the United States, you've seen now a lot more of uh, teachers in the United States who, uh, and to our eyes, it's like it's so jarring that they're so routine that they're just, uh, you know, arbitrarily going on, on TikTok or Instagram and going, hi guys, teacher here. Does anyone have any tips for how to, you know, practice your drills for a classroom lockdown? You know, does anyone know any good ways to... Sorry, just to be clear, what Gavin's talking about is a, is a drill for in case there's a school shooting. Yes, They practice sorry. in the same way we would have a fire drill. Yeah, sorry, I, I should, you should have been... in the United States do drills. Mindful that when we talk about lockdown, it means shooting. different things in different, different contexts. But they're talking about, yes, we need to practice a drill for what we do in the case of an active shooter on the campus. So does anyone have any tips for, you know, how we can try and get the kids to be more... No, hop to it like that yeah. and then you know being naturally bombarded with the responses of other teachers from elsewhere in the world from canada australia europe all saying no nope, can't really help you there because we don't do them and then those teachers replying going i know you guys don't have the same guns problem that we do but are you telling me that you don't do any and these american teachers actually thinking that the rest of the world is being reckless because we don't train children in how to deal with the genuine credible threat mm. of an active shooter just, in their uh, school. So just to explain what that actually, that drill is, is like they're basically, they act out as if there's an active shooter yeah. in the school. So the children have to go turn off the lights. They have to lock the classroom door. They cover the windows. The children have to hide under tables in the dark. And then the local is that the police department come in, I think, and they, they, they run tests. So they knock on the door of the classroom to make sure the teacher doesn't open the door. And if the teacher opens the door, the door then they've sort of failed the drill. Mm. Like this is the, I mean, the, uh, I so, was shocked so when the, I heard. So the, the, these are, are basically infants <clears throat> and barely, barely yeah. any older than toddlers who have to squat behind their desk. Or, or Sometimes like it can cover. last for up to 45, for like for 45 minutes. For 45 minutes, for yeah, three quarters of an hour. Dark. And yeah. they're, they're told, don't open the door if someone is knocking. And even if that means in a real life scenario, somebody could be knocking on your door desperate because they are trying to get out of harm's way. Mm. But you are trained not to open the door because if you open the door, you run the risk of allowing an attacker into the room. Uh, and it, it's just always so jarring to see how America has now become so normalized to that, that they, they don't see what we, you know, we, we, we're just about old enough to remember Dumblane mm. in, in mm. Scotland. And it was the first mass school shooting that there'd been in Britain. And in an immediate response, they said, right, we need to change the gun control laws and to have further background checks and to make it harder to acquire a weapon. And there hasn't been a single mass school shooting in Britain since. Because you acted once and it stopped the further ones. And yet this insistence on the other side of the Atlantic that the, the solution is to arm more people. That, that schools would be better secured if you had armed security roaming the corridors because that would be enough of a deterrent. Well, like one of the arguments just put forward by some politicians in the States in the aftermath of what's happened here in Texas is that, well, armed police should be there. Armed police responded to this before he went into the school. He still went into the school and shot 20 people. 
including 18 kids. Yeah. Um, mm, arming teachers and arming police doesn't stop people from doing this. There have been 27 school shootings in the United States in 2022 alone. 10 days ago, there was 10 people killed at a supermarket in Buffalo, New York, mm. um, in a racist uh, gun attack there. There was also a shooting at a Taiwanese church in California. Um, I don't know, we actually, it was only a couple of podcasts ago, we were talking about Roe versus Wade. Mm. And we were talking about, well, what are the Democrats going to do about this? And the answer was universally nothing. Mm. Mm. And I feel like we are already have, there's an acceptance in the United States that once again, it is going to be nothing is going to be the answer. That you have this idea that you have already Democratic senators saying, well, I don't know if we can go so far as to do this, but we will do everything that it takes apart from the stuff that would probably make mm. a difference. Uh, and they're already saying that this now has to influence how people vote in the midterms in six months' time, notwithstanding the fact that they already have a majority in the House, that they have the tie-breaking vote in the Senate, and that it's their guy in the White House. Mm. And they're, they're desperate for some other mandate to enact their agenda, because no matter how many children need to die before they decide that they've actually got enough power to do something with it. I, like, I think as well, you know, the, the role of it, like, there was a whole debate as well, like the governor had a press conference this evening and there was a whole debate over, was it, you know, was it mental health? You know, was this man, was the shooter sort of failed in some way in terms of mental health? And is it is it the battle between mental health and guns? And I think sometimes you hear that a lot, don't you, from people who are pro-guns, that this is not about the gun, it's about mental health. There was and... a senator um, from Utah today was saying, well, I can't believe the left is pushing guns control when this is maybe this is something to do with fatherless children and the breakdown of the family and it's like well if that's how the debate is going to be handled yeah. one statistic that jumped out to me was the fact now that among school children in the united states guns have now overtaken cars as the leading cause of death amongst children in the united states of america he went on social media you know the shooter beforehand on facebook and posted i'm going to shoot my grandmother which he obviously went on to do. And then I'm going to shoot an elementary school, he posted on social media. You know, these are incidents that, you know, are sort of played out now online as well, which is mm. completely and utterly horrific. Uh, but then to, you know, sometimes this, this kind of becomes like a, almost a parody because people just sort of treat America as being this basket case that is kind of unsolvable or that it's just now exists for other people's sort of comedy or amusement almost. Mm. Like... I don't know if it's even fair to assume, again, like this idea that it's some sort of a mental health crisis that they need to get to grips with rather than a guns one. Like, I'm sure that there's probably pro rata. There are a similar number of unhinged people in most other major countries in the world. There's probably a similar proportion of people who are unhinged in um, Canada or in Germany or in, uh, you know, a, more populated Asian countries or in African countries or in Brazil or Argentina, and we're not as exposed to them because those countries have smaller populations and they're not naturally English speakers, so we're not as exposed to their media. So I don't think America is necessarily any more broken a society than anywhere else. The difference is that you can walk into department stores in an awful lot of that country mm. and basically go, I'd like, the, I'd like the look of that weapon, please. I'd like an AR-15. You can't buy like two packets of Sudafed in the United States, but you can go in and buy... Yeah, a whole arsenal of weapons at your local supermarket. Mm. But, and, and but you, you can wander in and go, I'd like the look of that AR-15, please, mm. which is now the weapon of choice for killing loads of people indiscriminately, and no one in, seems intent on doing anything about it. It's it's kind of sad that as we have this conversation, though, there's a part of you that just, just knows that like, what what is going to change? And it's really difficult to keep having these conversations. How many more parents are going to drop their kids to school and, and and not get to pick them up at the end of the day? Like, mm. how many more times? Does this have to happen before, before change? Probably too many. It's interesting as well. Um, it's not confirmed whether or not all these people will attend this thing, but like the NRA, the National Rifle Association, the gun lobby in the United States, which is famously wealthy and famously donates millions and millions of dollars to politicians across the United States, is actually holding um, its annual conference effectively in the state of Texas on Friday. Speakers including former President Donald Trump, mm -hmm. the governor of Texas, uh, Mr. Abbott, and uh, other uh, Texas Republicans and senators who have the power to do something about this will all be in attendance of that. Uh, and impressively, Thanks. despite their insistence that guns are not the threat to people that the people are, uh, when Donald Trump is addressing that, uh, even the NRA will be barring attendees from bringing weapons into the auditorium. So, well, so you can, what are you going to do? Take your own interpretations of that. Yeah. But uh, before we go this evening, um, there's a couple of stories, a couple of headlines were made earlier on this week about the idea of members of the Oireachtas who, um, in their words, were basically forced to sleep in their cars mm. um, because they couldn't afford 
hotel accommodation in Dublin. We do know affordability of hotel accommodation in Dublin is a growing issue, particularly as we had the summer. Um, there has been some backlash. There's been a bit of a... There has been a discourse which has ensued yeah, uh, as a result of this. And Gavin, what's, what is your... Well, I've been talking to a lot of people in Enstra House about this and they were all somewhat aghast that any member of the Iraqis, particularly then Senator Eugene Murphy, who mm. confirmed uh, to our colleague Paul Quinn and to a few other outlets that he himself has uh, on occasion slept in his car because he couldn't get a hotel room in Dublin and then found himself too tired to commute all the way back to Roscommon. So he'd end up pulling in in Mullingar and, and sleeping in the car there beside a filling station instead. Uh, and somewhat aghast that they would even sort of concede that that was the case in their lives. Um, but just to make sure that, that people thought what I did think they'd do, that I put a question box on Instagram um, yesterday and asked what people thought. And the replies were almost universally, um, you know, oh, your heart would beat for them, world's tiniest violin. They earn enough money to afford it. Um, absolute bull, said one person. Um, pity about them, I'm struggling to keep my family going on care, so my sympathy doesn't extend there, says one person. Uh, more lies, I'd say. Might give them a taste of their own medicine. Uh, aren't they paying for it using an allowance, so what's the problem? Uh, someone else simply saying, I call bullshit. And only one person said, um, it's a disgrace, they do an important job and they should be assisted with proper accommodation. And I'm not saying that your, your heart should bleed for people who are, in the case of TDs, already on six-figure salaries and then get an allowance on top of that to pay for accommodation. The only thing I would say is that TDs basically work a full working week in Leinster House and it's crammed into three days so that they can spend Monday and Friday in their constituencies. And if you think that somebody should be working in Leinster House from Tuesday afternoon until Tuesday night, first thing Wednesday morning until last thing Wednesday night, and for a lot of Thursday, and doing that work with the basis of four or five hours of poor sleep sat beside, behind their own steering wheel, then I don't think that's conducive to the best quality of governance in the country. And I think the very least you should be doing if you're making decisions about the running of the country is getting a few decent hours on a mattress. I think he kind of admitted himself, though, that he hadn't looked for B&Bs, didn't he? He was saying that he hadn't actually kind of done a B&B &B search, that it was kind of just yeah, hotel. So yeah, and the, they... I think a lot of people will probably feel, though, that, like, when you know you have to be somewhere for a job and you're doing things, it, like, it does come down to kind of... Yeah, you know, ...being planning. an organised yeah. yourself. Like, and, and none of us should be sleeping in our cars no. going to work, realistically. But they, and, and they all know that it's always going to be Tuesday nights and Wednesday nights yeah. that they're likely to be around Leinster House, so there's, there's no sort of short-term emergency. And, and it was also pointed out, because there, there was some suggestions, or some people have allowed it to be believed, that there is an allowance, that they, they give themselves an annual allowance or a daily allowance of 120, 150, 200 euro, and that if they can't get it, that's it. That's not the allowance, and they're paid well enough that I think if they needed to pay for more, they could probably stretch it. Really, wow. last point. Uh, a Rose on Instagram tells us she tried to book a three-star hotel for Bruce Springsteen, uh, eight hundred and ninety-nine euro for the night. For next year. Eight. Next year, eight hundred and ninety-nine euro for a three-star hotel for one night for Bruce Springsteen. There Can't you get are. a night in Ennis to go and see me beating Claire the weekend <laughs> after next. Sorry, Richard. I care not. We have hurling. <laughs> we always have hurling. Uh, that is all we have time for on the group chat this week. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Gav. Thanks. Thank you, Richard. Thanks. We'll probably be back next week. <laughs> I'll see you then. <laughs> uh,